Hello, and thank you for joining me in another edition of A Word Midweek Live. I've been doing some scripture study and making my way slowly through the letters of St. Paul. I came upon this 13th chapter, the end of the 13th chapter, and where Paul says, and now faith, hope, and love, all of these abide. But the greatest of these is love. How many times have you caught yourself saying, hey, I love you, man. Or it's great to see you. I love you. Or maybe you sign off on an email or a letter with love. We can express that word love in so many different ways. But unfortunately, in our language, in the English language, we only have one word for love. And we have to say it in a way, or craft it in a way, or communicate it in a way that it's understood. Well, in the Greek, they did this by having different words to communicate what type of love they were talking about. I mean, for example, there are seven different words for love in Greek. And the use of those different words communicate a particular nuance or a specific type of message around what love means in that context. Okay, for example, we all know, we've all heard of Cupid shooting Cupid's arrow, right? And we know that love to be eros. It's romantic love. It's, it's love for, for physical beauty. And it's driven by our longing and yearning to be with another. It's probably the most popular way that we express love or think about love. But love can also be more intimate as in, as in an authentic friendship. You ever had those friends who are like soulmates? Right? They are just your best friend. There's something about that that just draws you or bonds you together. And in Greek, you can express that through the word philia. Sometimes we mistaken that to say, oh, that's brotherly love. But really, it's about having goodwill and wanting what's best for the other person in your life. There's also a, a very playful form of love that we know in Greek as ludus, it's like infatuation and also can have its root in just fun, hanging out together, being together, enjoying one another's company can be a form of love. And still there's other forms of love like storge. And storge is like what happens, in, it's that kinship, that bond that happens in families. Families can love each other, though sometimes they don't like each other. But it's a bond that holds them together, nonetheless. It's a bond of kinship. Storge is driven by this familiarity of being with one another through it all. Storge can also be a sense of, hey, this is my favorite sports team, or deeper than that a sense of patriotism for one's country that can all be expressed as a particular form of love. But what St. Paul is talking about here is not any of those forms of love, though they are all good and important expressions of how we relate to one another. What Paul is talking about here is agape love. Now, as Christians, we probably have heard of agape love. But to define it is kind of hard to get to. Agape love is kind of an empathetic, universal love. That ability, that, that empathy, it really means that I can walk around in your shoes and see and understand and experience and accept life in the way that you see and understand and accept life. 
It's without judgment. It's simply an intimate knowing. It's universal in the sense that it is not for any particular gain. It is just for the love of others, for humanity itself, as it is. It is connected in some ways to altruism, but it involves caring for and loving others without expecting anything in return. One writer described agape love as pay-it-forward love. I love that. Pay-it-forward love. Helping another, doing for another, selflessly. And I think St. Paul knew this, that he knew that this kind of love, though we never perfect it, we never quite live into it perfectly. But as we strive for it, it creates the foundation for great societies and great communities. And I think as people of faith, that's the love that we strive for as a, as a community of faith. It's the love that we have in our hearts in the ways that Jesus' life, death, and resurrection has touched us and calls us forward out into the world as disciples to love others, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself. This is agape love. Jesus says, love your enemies. This is agape love. Jesus says, love one another as I have loved you. That is agape love. So in the 13th chapter of Corinthians, Paul says it this way. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, faith big enough to remove mountains, but I do not have agape, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Agape is patient. Agape is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Agape bears all things and believes all things and hopes all things and endures all things. Because agape, love, never ends. So may that be. Let's finish with a word of prayer. This is a prayer found in the Book of Common Prayer. It's a prayer for the human family. O oh God, you made us in your own image and redeemed us through your Son, Jesus Christ. Look with compassion on the whole human family. Take away the arrogance and the hatred which infect our hearts. Break down the walls that separate us. Unite us in bonds of love, of agape, and work through our struggle and confusion to accomplish your purposes on earth. That in your good time, all nations and races may serve you in harmony around your heavenly throne. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As you come into this midweek, and as you look to the week ahead, I hope that you will look for opportunities to do some pay-it-forward loving. 
be well.